Thanks, guys. I, uh, it's really cool. Um, Matt, will you turn the lights up a little bit more? Because I can't see all the beautiful people that are here. And it's costume day today over in our kids' environments, and that's super fun. Last week, we pointed out we saw John's tie-dye on the screen from the, uh, the event that we had, and now here it is in person. It's pretty cool. And I see that Doug sitting in front of him is dressed up like Patrick Mahomes today. It's pretty awesome. And then uh, there's a cowboy hat back there, but I think that's just Jeff. But Jeff is always in the cowboy hat. So I today am dressed like somebody who's met their insurance deductible for the year. So <clears throat> it's fun. We can all just be dressed up like whoever. And if you're not dressed up like anything, you're dressed up like yourself, and that's all that you need to be dressed up like. And that's my Mr. Rogers moment for the day. You're you, and that's good enough for us. Uh, I did this last week, and I'm thinking it's going to kind of just be a thing that I do every time that I'm up here, is before we jump into what we're going to talk about, I want to take a second and talk about a couple other things first. Uh, this one, are, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what we're going to talk about today, and I am excited is a word uh, for this, but there's a really important thing that's happening a week from this Tuesday. Uh, in, in first service, I said it was happening this Tuesday because I think I'm just so ready for it to be over with. But there's a presidential election. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of anything like that happening before. Uh, and I want to take a second to just talk about us and how we relate to the events going on. I'm not going to offer any kind of direction or talk about any issues per, per se. Uh, that I think would be best for our country. There is one thing that I'm going to talk about that I think would be really best for our country. But uh, it's important for us to know that there is no candidate or political party that aligns completely with the values of Christianity. There are important issues around the things that we believe. But the thing that we believe that supersedes all of this is that our allegiance to the kingdom of heaven and to our King Jesus far surpasses our allegiance to any earthly nation or its human representative. It's very important for us to remember. No matter who wins the election, Jesus is still our king, and he sits on a throne that will never be defeated or conquered. So with that, it's important for us to behave like citizens of this kingdom, and that love is our primary identifier. The Bible says that the world will know us as Christians by our what? By our politics, you said? <laughs> no. That's, they'll know us by our what? Okay, they'll know us by our political party is what you said, if we're Republican or Democrat. That's, no, that's not right, you guys. Just kidding, you got it right. They'll know us by our love. And some of you in the coming weeks, months, however long it takes for all of this to be over with, uh, you may be tempted to be known by something other than love. Do not let that happen. Now imagine me saying that with like the clap emojis between each word, like you see written out sometimes. So do not let that happen. Okay? Do not ruin relationships with people over this election. People are eternal. Our nation isn't. Your citizenship within our country ends the minute that you take your last breath. But your citizenship within our kingdom is eternal. Relationships with people are eternal. Do not prioritize earthly politics over eternal people. None of the, these candidates or any of the candidates that we will ever vote for will probably be at your funeral. But there are people that are in your life right now that depending on how well you love them may or may not be. And to go even a step further than that, there are people in your life that, depending on how well you love them in seasons like this, may or may not be with us in heaven. So it's important. Go vote as citizens of our country, which is a great country. I'm so thankful to be a part of and be born in this country. It is our civic duty and responsibility to vote and participate in these things. But be kind, be loving. The thing that I, was, I referenced that would actually be the best thing for our world is if Christians in our country and around the world actually loved people the way that Jesus loves people. That could be 
the most transformative thing that could ever change uh, the, the history of humankind is if we love the way Jesus did, we love sacrificially. So let's start right now in this next season by sacrificing our desire to be right or our desire to prove a point or our desire to uh, gloat over our neighbor who is of a different affiliation politically and let's sacrifice those things, sacrifice those things for the opportunity to show love instead. Does that make sense? Sound good? Yeah. All right. The cool thing about what I just said is that I didn't come up with all that. That's just the Bible. So uh, I will not receive that hand clap for myself, but I will say thank you, Jesus, for being who you are. Um, but I will receive it in a way that makes me feel better because I hate talking about stuff like this up here. Uh, now that I'm done with that, uh, there's, I just want to recap the series that we just went through. Uh, the Dream a Better Dream series, which was two weeks about our vision and then five weeks about our revised or simplified core values. We broke down, these are the things that are the most important to us. I would just want to highlight them one more time for you and then hang on the last one that I talked about last week. Uh, but our core values coming into the future, you know, I, don't, I was going to attach an amount of time to it, but for the foreseeable future, these are what we're all about. The first one being Jesus, that understanding that Jesus is our king and that Jesus is a friend. Uh, and then uh, discipleship with uh, focusing on becoming disciples of Jesus and making disciples of Jesus. And then our last one is being movement focused or being focused on participating in the gospel movement that's happening all around the world. And uh, rather than, this is what I talked about last week, rather than being focused on building a gathering, it's more important for us that we add to the attendance of heaven than we add to our Sunday morning attendance here at Four Corners. So if you weren't here last week, I really want to encourage you to check out that message on the website. Not because I did such a good job. I probably didn't. I felt, you know, I don't ever know. But, and that's not me fishing for compliments either. Don't come up to me like, we really love what you've been doing. Like, don't do that. Uh, it'll make me feel weird. It'll make me feel like I guilted you into kindness, which, anyway, now this is awkward. <laughs> Check out our website. So just so you can find out what this movement is about that we are called to be a part of here at Four Corners. Uh, and there's a QR code that we threw up at the end of the message last week. We're going to throw it up again. Um, if you feel like the Lord has been stirring things within your heart, uh, maybe calling you to step out beyond just regular Sunday attendance and participate in this gospel movement that's happening around, uh, you can scan the QR code and fill it out. And all that does is just gives us information that you are one of those people that God's been stirring something inside of. Uh, maybe you didn't get a chance to do it last week. Maybe you didn't do it last week and this week thought that you maybe should have. Here's your chance to do it again. Even if you're on the fence about maybe, I'm not sure if God's calling me to do this or not, um, it might be worth it just to fill it out and to come to, we're going to get everybody together um, soon and have us a, a beginning the conversation meeting about what we're doing. And if you come to that and you're like, okay, I don't really want to do this, totally cool. We won't be that offended. Uh, now, today... Really exciting. We're beginning our generosity series where we talk about money. Aren't you so excited? Politics and money on the same Sunday? Oh, man. I need a drink of water. <laughs> I didn't even realize as I was saying I need a drink how that sounded until I, until I said it. it was, it's not that big. Not that deep. But it is, though. So here... Uh, we're beginning this series, and I want to do two things today. I want to talk really transparently about our finances right now. I want to talk about the kingdom offering that's coming up in the next two weeks. And I want to talk about uh, what our finances look like and our vision for our finances in the future coming into 2025. So we're going to break it down kind of into where we are right now and where we are going. So uh, after that, we'll talk about why. And so first up, I just, I really excited to share this statistic. 
we have, as a church, given away $60,000 this year to organizations that are part of our community to advance kingdom work throughout our city, and that's a really big deal, you guys. $60,000 is a lot of money. Um, and that's an incredible number for a church that's our size in the city that we live in. Uh, first service, I did really, really bad math. And I said, that's like giving away $1,000 per person. It's not. That would be $1,000 per person that attends our church would be $600,000. I'm not good at math. I never have been. So when you hear me say math things up here, just, just somebody fact check it. Uh, and it, somebody did last service, and that's why I'm here to say I said that wrong. So, but we are really proud of that $60,000 number, and you should be too, because that's the generosity of our church. Uh, that's the fruit of it. That's, a, that's evidence of it written down on paper. That money breaks down into a few different places, and a large chunk of that goes to, uh, has gone to uh, the Independence Hub of the Kansas City Underground. Uh, talked about the underground last week and their, uh, their mission to live incarnationally and take the gospel to the people around them and create uh, and plant micro churches in the community around us. We really uh, are big fans of the Independence Hub and we have several people that are a part of our church that are even part of the Independence Hub uh, in the past or currently. Uh, we've also given money to JT and Anna Farr and their organization Mission 91. JT and Anna were a part of our church family for years. And then one day, I remember when JT talked to me about this for the first time, they decided, or they felt like the Holy Spirit had been speaking to them. And so they decided to sell their house. They sold 98% of everything they owned. We actually had a, a garage sale here in the lobby of the city house. Some of you may have come up and helped um, fund their mission by purchasing some of their stuff, uh, but they sold everything and loaded up their truck with their kids and anything that they could fit in the bed of their truck and moved to Montana to, to train to be missionaries. And we are so proud of them. We're so inspired by them um, and for their obedience and the difference that they've been making in the world. And listen, here's the thing. If you're like me, when you grew up in church and you said, God, uh, you're like kind of afraid to pray the prayer of like, God, I'll do anything that you want me to do because you think that he's going to call you to move to Africa and leave everybody behind. And that's not true. It just happened to be true kind of this time for JT and Anna where they do a lot of work in Southeast Asia and they sold our stuff. He's not always going to call us to abandon everything about us, but he wants to change the life that we have and the, the heart that we have inside of us more than he wants to change our current existence. So anyway, when you hear stories like that, don't be afraid to like pray prayers of like, God, I want to live for you. I want to sacrifice my life for you because you're afraid of now having to live on the other side of the world. Uh, the Fars don't still. They live in Montana. Hopefully they'll be back soon. But they do go to Southeast Asia and help do a bunch of stuff. And um, So a large chunk of that $60,000 has also gone towards benevolence needs, in uh, which are our tangible needs that arise within our church family, in our tight-knit community here. Benevolence are, so when we share wins on a Sunday of, we helped somebody meet, uh, pay their electric bill, or we helped a, a mom get formula or diapers, or we helped whatever tangible needs that come up in our church family, we give benevolence money towards that. So this year we've given away almost $6,000 in benevolence, which is great. It's a big deal. Uh, we've also given away almost $10,000 to scholarship kids in our church to go to camps this year, which was awesome. You guys remember this summer, um, we had what felt like never-ending fundraisers in the lobby where you could buy $20 donuts and maybe the best cookies that have ever existed. Uh, but that money went and made a big difference in helping our kids go to camps where they met Jesus. Some for the first time, they had their lives transformed, and we got to hear a lot of testimonies and cool stories about that. Um, and then there's other nonprofit organizations that we've been able to help this year. Uh, there's other church plants we've been able to help this year, like the guys that all came through Summer Vibes, uh, Mike Orta and his wife Tiffany at City House Church in Milwaukee, Justin and Sam Roberts, part of Neighbors Church, and Thomas and Jen Miller, part of Growth KC, all church plants that we've been able to help this year um, in little ways. So, but what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna, uh, I wanna be really clear about 
the goals that we've set for the kingdom offering and why. So when you walked in on your seat, you had a little card like this. If you didn't see one, you may be sitting on it. Uh, everybody pull them out. Just pull out the card if you got it. Or if you don't have it, there might be one next to you on a seat. Wave it around in the air like you just don't care. And it's kind of hot. So this is actually really nice. It's, um, I, I could be that I'm wearing this jacket, uh, which is a shirt jacket. If you've never heard of a shacket before, you can tell that it's a shacket because it has pockets, not just a normal button-up flannel shirt. It has pockets. Shackets are great. Uh, my mom wore a shacket last year for the first time. I said, hey, you've got a cool shacket on. And she said, I don't know what that is. And I said, oh, maybe you've heard it referred to as a jert before, <laughs> a jacket shirt. And she goes, what are you talking about? I was like, it's a, and I had to explain it to her. It's a shack. it's a, it's a, it's a shirt jacket combination. And you can tell it has pockets. Everybody loves pockets. You know this because uh, every woman that I know that when they wear a new dress, they go, look, it has pockets. Uh, and so pockets are important. I'm wearing this as, um, I don't know why I'm still wearing it because I am hot. So I might do this every now and then or drink more water. Take out the card, look at it. So the first, we do a big offering every year around this time of year uh, for a couple different reasons. The most important reason is because we move into this holiday season where we come into Thanksgiving and we are reminded of how grateful we are for the Lord, the things that he's given to us. We have this, this, this season of gratitude of giving thanks. Uh, and one of the things that we're most thankful for is the gift of Jesus as we move into Christmas season. That is the greatest gift that's ever been given to humanity. We're so thankful for that. And so doing an offering like this at the end of the year is our way to say, God, we, are, we want to give to you materially uh, before we give to ourselves materially. We want to honor you with our finances because we recognize that you have given it all to us. And so this is a way that we show him that we want to be good stewards of the money that he's given to us. And Jeremy's going to talk next week about stewardship. Uh, now, the way that, uh, that we've done this for the last few years and given away money is through an organization. Uh, well, it's not an organization. It's our thing. It's an initiative called Kingdom Builders. Some of you guys may remember we had little books that we passed out at the beginning of the year or the end of last year. Uh, and inside of it, it had a bunch of different organizations with dollar amounts that we would love uh, to meet and organizations we want to partner with. Um, and, and, and within that, some of, the, some of those organizations are organizations that we made commitments to at the beginning of the year. So uh, we began paying out some of those commitments before we had actually brought all the money in. So we've given away $60,000, but currently we've only brought in about 45 through Kingdom Builders. So the first goal in the Kingdom offering is... $15,000, and that's representative of the money that we are still wanting to bring in that we have paid out already. So those same commitments to all these organizations that we really believe in, those commitments last through the end of the year, and they will add up to about another $15,000. So that's goal number two puts us to meet the commitments that we've already made. And, that, and listen, this is not like a, we believe that this money is going to a good place. And when we make these commitments at the beginning of the year, we do it because we feel like that's what the Lord is leading us to do. So we trust him. This is not a fear-based thing. We're like, oh no, we haven't brought in enough money. What are we going to do? We're going to honor these commitments. And we're going to give this out. And we would love to do that through this offering. But we have made the commitments to these organizations. And we're going to follow through because that's the integrous thing to do. Um, and just we would love to do it through this offering. So the last uh, goal is $50,000, and what that'll do is it'll give us extra money on top of the commitments we've already made to specific organizations to meet the needs of other organizations, like the ones that are listed on the card. Um, and so that's our heart. Um, now, that's, that's the status of where things are and kind of what's coming up in the next two weeks with the kingdom offering. Looking forward into 2025, we're actually going to do away with kingdom builders. So, it, and I am actually really excited about what's going to happen in 2025. We feel like the Lord has led us to simplify, and through simplification, we think that it's actually going to be way more effective at giving 
money away and helping meet needs in our community and the world. So we are going to move towards being a tithing church. So uh, we just feel like this is a way for us to model stewardship. When we talk about tithing here as a church and as individuals, we want to also model that as a church where 10% of the money that comes in, 10% being uh, where the word tithe comes from, 10% of the money that comes in will then go back out to meet needs. Um, the principle of the tithe was referenced in the book of Malachi chapter 3, where God asks uh, his people to give a tenth of the harvest back to him. So as a church, we're committing to at the end of each month, we will give away 10% of everything that came in for that month. So if our budget next year in 2025 and just using round numbers because the math is easier and I've already explained to you how I need help with math. Uh, using these round numbers, if our budget for next year is a million dollars, then that means that by the end of the year, we will have given away $100,000, which is a lot bigger number than 60. And that would actually, I believe 100,000, if we give that away, would be the largest amount of money we've ever given away as a church or it would be right at the equal to portion of it. That 10%, uh, that $100,000, and 10% of what comes in, we wanted to break down into four places specifically. I wanna talk through what these four places are. So four, so you divide 10% into four different places. You have two and a half percent. That breaks down the first two and a half percent goes towards benevolence, so needs in our church family. So when any of you go through some sort of crisis or unexpected thing that happens and you need help, you can call us. And if we have the money, we will help. Um, there are some stipulations around that. Um, but we, as a church, want to help take care of the needs of our people. Um, and so when you give money, it goes towards helping to take care of our church body and our church family. Uh, another 2.5% will go towards local missions. And local missions is uh, what we're calling community partners. So some of these nonprofit organizations that are making a big difference in our city already, we want to help continue to partner with them and to fund them um, and to give each month to help them meet the needs that they have that come up so they can be more effective at expanding and doing kingdom work here in our city. Uh, another 2.5% will go towards global missions. These are organizations that are taking the gospel around the world. Uh, organizations like The Bridge in Haiti. We have been partnering with them for a long time. They do a lot of really important work in Haiti. Haiti is a crazy place. Um, it's a dangerous place, and they've been on the ground for a long time doing really good work. We love them. There's also um, New Thing Global, um, which is the global wing of the New Thing church planning movement. They might fit into the next category or that one. We'll have to figure out what, the, what that looks like. Uh, mission 91, JT and Anna Farr would fall into the global missions. Um, and then organizations like Project Hope that we uh, here in just a few days are sending a bunch of people on a, on a mission trip to Nicaragua um, through to do work with Project Hope. We, we hope to be able to um, help supplement or even scholarship people to go on things like these mission trips. That'll happen through this percentage of our giving. And then the last two and a half percent goes towards church planting. So we are, a, at one time, we were a church plant. We we're pretty settled and we've got deep roots in our community now. So we aren't just, uh, but we were at one time a, a, a brand new body of believers that used to show up real early, meet over at Truman High School and set this whole thing up and tear it down and, not, and, and kind of wonder if people were ever even going to come back. Um, and so we understand what that's like and we believe in the mission of planting churches. Um, in fact, planting churches that plant churches that plant churches. And so that idea of multiplication is part of the movement that I talked about last week. Um, another little plug. But there's a couple different like ways that we give to church planning. There's New Thing, I mentioned New Thing Global. There's also New Thing Local. New Thing is an organization that play, that plants more traditional churches that like they meet on a Sunday, they have a gathering and they go out. Um, the Kansas City Underground that I mentioned before is a church planting organization, sort of. They, they work on advancing the gospel through living incarnationally and planting micro churches that plant churches that plant churches. And then we wanna be able to give to specific church plants 
again in the coming year, like the ones that I mentioned, like Rock Island, like any other church planters that come. Maybe one of you will get a bug to go start a church someday, and we want to be able to help you, and this is how we will do that. So breaking it down, if our budget is a million dollars, we need to bring in $80,000 a month to hit our budget next year in 2025. 10% of 80 is $8,000 split up into four categories means that we will give away $2,000 each month to each one of these categories. And that's a significant improvement on what we've been able to do so far in the last few years. Um, I'm very excited about that. And, and here's the thing too, if we only bring in $60,000 that month, then we'll give away 1,500 to each one of these things. If we bring in $100,000, then we'll give away 2,500. The amount that goes out is dependent on the amount that comes in, not, um, not just, well, the, one of the reasons we're really excited about this is because it does two things. One is that we will never go in the red to ourselves again because we believe in biblical stewardship. We don't want to do that. We don't want to owe money to ourselves. When we do offerings like this, we want to just be able to give it all away right away, not to pay ourselves back for investments that we've already made. Um, and then the thing that I'm the most excited about is that we can help way more people and we can start way earlier in the year. So one of the things that the way that Kingdom Builders was set up is that sometimes we have organizations that we want to help, but we can't help them until everything has come in at the end of the year. So we'll talk, we talked to organizations about helping them last year. We still haven't been able to, but we're hoping to through this offering. We're also thinking about different ways uh, that we can be more open with the current status of our finances and how that breaks down. So in addition to every month, we have baked in opportunities to share wins in regards to each of these four categories uh, that we will be giving to. Uh, we even throw around the ideas of different ways to let you guys know like how much money is coming in every month. A lot of churches, some of you may have grown up in a church where they would put like the church finances in the bulletin every week that you'd see like, what was the attendance this week? And then last week we brought in this much money. And then uh, next, you know, we, we probably won't do that just because we don't want our printing budget to like skyrocket next year. But we do have digital signage. So maybe on, we're just throwing these ideas around, maybe on the screens in the lobby, you'll have a slide that says, here's our projected budget. Here's what came in week one of the month. Here's what came in week two, just to keep you guys updated. Some of you guys, that sounds really cool. You would love to know that stuff. Some of you guys don't care about that, and that's totally cool too. Uh, but we want to make sure that one of the most important things for this series for us, and I talked about this last week, is that we build trust. We want you guys to trust us. We want to have transparency. We want to be open with what our goals and our objectives here are because we understand that giving your money to us is a big step of um, of discipleship. It's a discipleship part for your heart to, to give God control of your finances. And then, but it's also an act of trust that you are trusting that we are going to be good stewards of the money that you give to us as an organization. And so it's really important to us. Another way that you can see how things will break down even a little bit deeper is we have an annual business meeting that'll be coming up in December. Um, you are all invited to that. We will I don't have a specific date for that yet. We're kind of um, just after this offering, we'll have time to get our numbers locked in. And in that meeting, as soon as we have the date, we will let you know because we want everybody to come who wants to come. Uh, but in that meeting, we'll break down how our finances went this year in 2024, and then we'll break down the budget and what it looks like going into 2025. Um, so if you're into this stuff, if you want to go a little deeper into the weeds, that budget meeting will be a place, or that business meeting will be a place to do that. Um, a spoiler alert, just a little spoiler alert to what that meeting will look like. Our finances are in a really good place, you guys. Like, considering everything that we've been through as a church, um, our, our overseers and other, like, people that we have functioning as advisors to us are throwing around words like miracle and unprecedented. And if you're like me, you became very familiar with the word unprecedented during the pandemic when it's like every week weird, this is an unprecedented thing that's just happened. And it's like, I began to hate that word. Like, when can we get some precedented times? Uh, but now I'm kind of like, like, oh, unprecedented can be a good thing too. 
that it's not normal for churches that go through things like what we've gone through this year to be in the place that we're in. And that is a testament to the faithfulness of Jesus, that God cares about this house, that he cares about you, and he cares about the mission that we're on. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited. Like I said, our finances are stable and we're in a good place. And so if there's any of you that are still like, just like in the back of your mind, like I hope we're gonna be okay, are things all right? And those of you that have been, that are new, you may not have any idea what I'm talking about and that's totally cool. You can come talk to me about this uh, afterwards and I'll tell you kind of our history for the last year, what's gone on. But uh, those of you that have been here for a little while, we're in a good place and God is good. Um, and so I mentioned that um, how we view our finances and coming into this offering and uh, giving God control of our money is a, is a discipleship conversation. And I wanna break that down a little bit and, and who better to break that down than Jesus himself. So let's open up. Um, well, if you have a Bible, open up. If you don't, then open your phone. Uh, or your mind. Uh, let's look at Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. So someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And I, I love reading the Bible because like little things like jump out to me in really weird, quirky ways that my brain works. So like either Jesus doesn't know this guy's name uh, or he talks kind of like me, where he's like, Jesus replied, man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter between you? And I like to believe it's the last way. I don't know if there's like a lot of breakdown theologically that people that have studied that, but um, then he said to him, watch out. That's also how Jesus speaks in my brain. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then, because there are so many, I've got so many crops, I have no place to do this. And he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years, take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for, with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Are you living a life that is rich toward God or rich toward yourself? Have you told Jesus that you want him to be the king or the Lord of your life? Have you given him control over things like your marriage? Have you given him control over things like your kids? That's a pretty easy one for those of us that are parents because uh, once a week you're like, Jesus, I don't even know what to do with these kids. You better just take over because I'm about to lose my mind. So we give control of our kids often. You've given him control of your time because you're here. You get up early, you come to church. You give him control of these things, but not yet let him have full control because you haven't given him control of your finances, your money. Maybe you prayed prayers like, God, my whole life is yours. God, my heart is yours. God, everything I have is, almost everything that I have is yours, God. This is a prayer that I have prayed. I'm familiar with this because I'm human. I know this conversation well. I still struggle with this. And there's two main reasons why I think we all struggle to give God control of our finances. I don't think there's anything more difficult to give him control over. One, because of our comfort our desire for comfort. This parable of the rich fool that Jesus just gave is an example of this man's desire for comfort. He's, he's a rich man, 
a rich farmer. He's probably worked really hard to get to the place where he's at. He's probably worked really hard to have an abundance of harvest this year. And now he's looking forward to the fruits of his labor paying off, and he doesn't have to work so hard. He's looking forward to taking the next year off and just eating and drinking and being married. It sounds a little bit like looking forward towards retirement. And that's okay. But he's hoarding his wealth for the sake of his comfort. He was being rich towards himself, but not being rich towards God and his kingdom. The other reason it's so hard to give God control of our finances is security. And this is the one that hits home for me. I don't feel like I've had enough money throughout my life to really indulge in a lot of comforts. Uh, I'm blessed. But the comforts that I have been given, I want to protect them. I want to, they, they provide a sense of security. Money provides a sense of security, especially in times and seasons that we're living in right now where things are up in the air. Uh, money can protect us from tragedy. A lot of problems in our life can be solved easily if we just have money to throw at it. How many of you uh, have ever, this is a minute example, but how many of you have ever been working on a car and then it breaks down again and you work on your car and then you have to work on your car and then like you're just so tired of working on your car you just have the thought of like, man, I just, how do I get enough money that I can just pay somebody to do this so I don't have to be out here in the hot heat of the sun and I can just sit on my couch while somebody else does this for me. I have had that conversation also because I'm terrible at working on cars I'm a musician. There's stereotypes that exist for a reason. <laughs> Money provides a lot of security for us. It reassures us that we're going to be okay. But if we're, if we're not giving God access to our finances because we need it to feel secure, to feel safe, then we're communicating two things to him. One we're communicating to God that we don't believe the promises that he's made to us in his word. We don't believe the things that he's told us. And two, we're communicating that we believe that we can take care of ourselves better than he can. That we believe that we can do a better job at protecting ourselves, taking care of ourselves than the one who created us. Jesus talks about this as we keep reading in verse 22. I'm going to shift a little bit because my left leg is falling asleep and my right leg is what it is. And so I don't want to just fall off the chair. Uh, verse 22, then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body or what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, it's funny how Jesus calls this a very little thing. You can't add an hour to your life. It's a very little thing to the God of the universe. But you can't do it. Why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So Jesus is saying when we seek first his kingdom, when we seek relationship with God, when we seek following after and participating and being citizens of his kingdom, that he meets all of our needs. He takes care of us. And then he says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail, 
where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we're gonna wrap up today with communion. Ushers, you can go ahead and begin to pass the elements whenever you're ready. We're gonna take a second to remember what Jesus has done for us. That's why we take communion. Jesus said, whenever you gather, do this, partake of communion in remembrance of me. We remember his body that was broken for us. We remember his blood that was poured out for us. And in this act of worship, in this moment, as we remember what he's done, the promises that he's made to us, we wanna invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to investigate your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal your heart's true condition to you, specifically how it relates to these two questions. Where is your treasure? Have you been rich towards yourself or rich toward God? As he reveals these things to you, ask him to give you the courage and strength that you need to make the changes that he's gonna ask you to make. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for the life that you've given us. We're so thankful for the hope that you've given us. We're so thankful for the freedom that you've given us. It's in response to that life that you've given us, your life, that you laid down your life. We give our lives to you in return. We give you the parts of our life that are easy to give. We wanna give you the parts of our life that are harder to give. Lord, it's scary to give you control of things sometimes. So I pray that you would give us peace. Pray that your spirit would speak to us, provide clarity and provide reassurance that your promises are true you are who you say that you are. And in this moment, I ask that you would reveal yourself to us, what our next steps look like, growing deeper in relationship with you. Be with us in this moment. We love in your name. Amen. You can partake of the elements whenever you're ready.